the other thing you and I talked about was that fasting got a bad rap for killing microbes. And when I dove into the studies, what I saw is, yeah, it, it creates an environment in the gut where your microbes that are not healthy are no longer welcome. And so the body, this whole microbial shift that happens while fasting is actually, yes, it's a breakdown, but if you bring fibery foods, prebiotic, probiotic rich foods into that first meal, you get this explosion of new bacteria. Can you speak a little bit on that? Because this is the, the most common criticism that I have gotten by professionals. This is, these aren't the con everyday person. By colleagues and professionals is that fasting kills the microbes. And I keep saying there's more to the conversation than you need to know about. Yeah, I, as you know, I fall on the exact opposite end of that argument. I think that fasting is great for microbes for a lot of the same reasons why it's great for your other cells in your body. And and moreover, we know that with our microbes, they can go into dormant states. They can, they, they know how to survive periods of not eating because, I mean, they've co-evolved with us. And so I, I think there's two important things to note. You know, one is that your kind of killing off microbes. It's not like they get depleted and they can never come back. They're 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 sort of in they've they've evolved to be able to go into dormant states. But the second thing is that you can by choosing to starve everybody, again, this is what gives you the opportunity to replenish the specific mm -hmm. strains that you want to replenish. And there's a big kind of misconception in the microbiome field, which is that diversity is king. Mm. That diversity is the most important thing in your microbiome. And that is not true. It's actually there are certain things that certain functions that you want to have an abundance of. And there are other functions that you could just do without. And so it is an ecosystem in which there are certain, you know, so-called guilds that you want to have more of. And there are certain guilds that you want to have less of. And so it's not just about overall diversity. It's about a certain uh -huh. kind of diversity. But how would you, and, and so this is the, the, this is where the conversation gets dark really quick because I think like, how do you know what your diversity of your microbiome is? And I've looked at every stool test. We used to do a ton of stool tests in my office and I finally gave up on it because I was like, this is a moving target. The microbiome is changing every couple of days. So is there a way for us to actually understand what our actual balance of our microbes are? Well, I think, you know, first of all, th there's sort of two pieces to this. One is actually measuring your microbiome and the other is you're measuring your symptoms and 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 how mm. these things change because your microbiome is does affect a lot of things outside of just, you know, what what you can measure and a lot of it is stuff, stuff that you feel, so things like food cravings, sleep, energy levels, all these things are your microbiome literally is sort of giving you a feedback loop of what's working and not working. Your your poop, like I always tell mm. people, the best diagnostic marker of your microbiome in the world for all time is it's just your poop. So, okay. you know, it, there's this this weird phenomenon when you ask people, like, well, I'll ask you, have you ever pooped and then looked back in the toilet bowl to every see day. what you look like every uh, day? Every day. I, every time I poop, I look. I, but And I have, a, I have a thought of what it's supposed to look like, but I would love to hear your your opinion on it. Well, that's right. You have a thought of what's specifically, but you're looking every day and like you get annoyed if there's too much toilet paper because you're like, oh, I can't see my poop. Right, and and yeah. there's a, there, there's like a very kind of built in framework of like, look at your poop, look at your poop. And, you know, for your listeners, I, I would say, are you know, think about it. Are you looking at your poop? Are you annoyed when there's too much toilet paper? And then ask the question, what are you looking for? Yeah. Why are you looking at it? And I think most people don't know why they're looking at it. It's like, well, I don't know. I'm just feel compelled to see what my poop looks like. And what you're looking for, what your brain is is clocking in is baseline. It's baseline of what does your poop always look like? And when your poop looks weird, there's like a freak out, you know, like, oh, man, that's not what my poop's supposed to look like. That's not what it's supposed to feel like. And that is a natural system baked in of what's happening inside of you is showing up as what's coming out of you. And so I, so cool. you know, not to get too gross and not to be a non-scientist. No, go for it. Your I poop love, is telling you a lot. Yeah. Okay. So what should it look like? So in the end, like the kind of the, the most healthy poops are probably more around how frequently you're going. So you don't want to be going seven times a day, but you don't want to be going every other day. So 
you know, one to three times, you know, a day, I think is a pretty normal cadence. You don't want it to feel like too runny. I mean, you don't want it to feel then also like it's hard to poop. So kind of the if you if you have a dog and you watch how fast they poop, I mean, it's mm-hmm. amazing. They just get out there, they get their business done and they're done. And that's how we're supposed to poop. You're not supposed to be out there for half an hour, you know, with predators all around you pooping. And so, you know, I think the more important thing that the consistency, uh, the consistency, consistency is linked to it is how frequently you're doing it and how quickly it, it happens for you. And I think that those are important. So it should look, you know, roughly like a, you know, stool, not, not, you know, too watery. Right, and yeah. then, and, and it should be pretty easy to poop. Easy. It shouldn't take yeah. you and half an hour to, to poop unless you're doing other stuff. Yeah. You're right. Unless you brought your phone in there and now you're putting yourself in sympathetic state and, and pooping is a parasympathetic activity. Exactly. So, exactly. You know, when I was in clinical practice, it shocked me how many people don't have a daily bowel movement. And I just want to point out that that is massively important because it is how your body detoxes itself. So do you have any, if somebody doesn't have a daily bowel movement, are there some just tried and true things we should be doing to make sure that we can actually and effortlessly poo? Well, you know, the kind of, I was just at a brunch yesterday and someone had made these homemade, you know, jams and jellies. And one of them was peaches and the other one was prunes. And I said, everyone be careful when you taste the prune jam, because if you're not used to eating prunes, it can be very potent for you. And so, and that's what it does. It unclogs the system and, yeah. and, and it's very real. So if you are feeling backed up, you know, prunes, I think are a really great way. And then, and then fiber. I mean, really, mm-hmm. this is one of the things that, you know, Metamucil has been around forever. And mm-hmm. it's one of those tools that people can use. Fundamentally, though, there is a strain that is a emerging as a keystone strain in your in your gut microbiome that appears to play a role in actually having, you know, this helping with this regulation. And there and and it sort of works in a consortium with other strains, but there's one strain, Clostridium butyricum. And actually, it's been used in Japan for a long time for IBS symptoms and even IBD. And it really helps to regulate kind of your your bowel movements. And it works with this other strain, which is emerging as a keystone strain called Acromantia mucinophila. And that's also a really important strain. And both of these strains are often depleted when you start to look in, in people who are aging. And then just to get back to your other question about how can you really survey the microbiome, I think it's really challenging with all these, like there's a new company offering a new test every single day. Right. But as a practitioner, you have the ability to get your patients access to I th- what I think are two of the good tests out there. One is Genova Diagnostics has mm-hmm. a really good gut yep. test. And the other DSL has a really good GI map test. Both of those, I think, are really good microbiome tests. But the key is that you can't think about the microbiome as a, a single point in time. You have to be taking longitudinal tests and getting your baseline because, yes, there are things that will change from time to time, but there you do have kind of like a baseline core microbiome that that becomes the key part. So, okay, that actually brings up a study that are, it was more like a paper that was written by National Geographic many years ago. And it was about a journalist in UK that went to Africa and he lived with a tribe for three days. Do you know, do you know this story? I don't know this story. No, okay. but I've heard other people doing this. Yes. Yeah. So they measured his gut microbiome and then they sent him to go live with this tribe and he ate and did everything that the tribe did. One of the biggest things they ate was porcupine. So it was like new food, new environment. Then he flew back and they had seen in three days that his like a majority of the microbes in his gut had actually changed because his environment had changed, which really what and this study was done. I mean, this article was done like 10 years ago. And what came out of that was a discussion about how quickly we can change our microbiome. So I, do we have any indication like if somebody's listening to this and they're like, oh, my God, I don't. I don't have a daily bowel movement. I haven't even been eating enough fiber and they want to make a shift to their microbiome. How quickly can we see changes in the microbiome? Super fast, super fast. You can see a difference in your microbiome, depending on how depleted it is. But I will like I'll get everybody here probably knows an example of when you traveled somewhere and within 24 hours, 
you felt a change to your bowel movements. And so I think that that tells you that is how quickly when you change your environment, when you change your food, you can dramatically change your microbiome even within 24 hours. And so I think that that's the that's the beauty of the microbiome Mm -hmm. because we know that there are a lot of things that are happening to us throughout our lives, causing our microbiome to become depleted. We know those depletions are linked to a wide variety of diseases, even including, you know, getting to the brain, you know, Parkinson's disease have these links now to the microbiome. But the beautiful thing about the microbiome is unlike your genes, where you sort of get what you get, you can change your microbiome and we are changing it accidentally all the time. And so if you're doing it purposefully and thoughtfully and deliberately, you can change your microbiome really quickly and see these immediate health outcomes, and w- which is really, you know, amazing. And then I would say the other thing, too, is like because you're doing it naturally, it does depend on how depleted you are. So you can sometimes see some things very quickly and then other things it does take a second. And so but but you can change your microbiome super within fast. 24 hours. Super. Which is, yeah. So encouraging. 